the beekeeper. From Middle Lane in Trumshambo. She's going to tell us all about bees. We had a fascinating conversation yesterday, and uh, I want you all to hear this. Hey, oh, Mary. How you doing, Tom? How long have you been a, bee a beekeeper? About six years. Right. Um, and it was just one of those mad ideas that got into my head one day. Uh, my dad used to keep bees when I was a, a young, mad teenager, and uh, I had absolutely no interest in, in them at that stage at all. It's only in latter years that uh, you settle down and you start thinking about these things for yourself. Could you explain to us what this, uh, this box is down here that you showed me yesterday? Yeah, this little box here is called a uh, mating hive. Uh, it's uh, also known as an apodia, which is just a trade name. And it's, um, it's for... Sorry, could you, st could you start that over again? I'm sorry, sure. I, I didn't get it. Okay. Just from the... Okay, what's the, what is this box here, Mary? This, this box is called a uh, queen mating hive. It's uh, also called an apodia, which is just a brand name. Uh, and it's for um, bringing on uh, a queen cell that you may have been able to find in a full hive. Uh, and um, in, in the uh, normal scheme of things, the colony of bees will actually produce about, well, anything from two to 20 queen cells, depending on how they're feeling, uh, for, uh, for actual um, reproduction. So when a, when a colony reaches a certain stage, they have decided it's time we replace the queen. Now it may be simply that they're running out of space and it's time for her to move so that a young queen can come in and they can still use that space. The old queen goes away with the older flying bees and sets up house in another chamber somewhere. Could be in a tree or your attic or if you're lucky and a beekeeper in a hive. So. I'd be trying to catch the queens You're before they disappear. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So you were telling me yesterday, and it just blew my mind. Mm -hmm. It's actually the queen lives in here, like in a palace, and there's like a servants and everything. Yeah. What you do is you try and get a, what we could say a cup full of, of nurse bees out of any hive at all, um, and you put them in through the bottom drawer of this box. You just get your cup full of bees and dump them in close them over and you also have it with food in it and you have your queen cell which you've harvested from a, a, a hive and you suspend it through this little hole here um, and you close it all up you make sure that they have food and liquid and um, you keep this closed with a ventilation, which seems to have gone missing. Here it is, a little right. ventilator that covers that uh, entrance. And for three days, you keep them in the dark and you just spray them a few times a day. What's spraying? S it's mist, uh, just mist spray, water and a little bit of sugar. Yes, exactly. And what yeah. would your food be? Uh, normally, they would uh, collect nectar from plants, but because they're confined, it's a sugar paste that I'm putting in there with them. Uh, or it could be sugar syrup either. But if you're gonna turn it upside down to put bees in, you don't want syrup in there because it's gonna go everywhere. Uh, so fondant, uh, which is like what you find on cakes. Right. But it has like to be the icing pure almost, yeah. Icing, exactly, yeah. I'm gonna take this off, yeah. it's too warm. Now what about, uh, uh, you were saying something yesterday about the the, 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 the sort of the mating habits where the male kill, basically he kills himself mating. Yeah, he, it's not that he kills himself, but he, he dies in the process of um, a mating with the queen. The queen, after she has emerged from her cell, it's like any egg, you know, she kind of goes through the, the, the stages. different stages. But once she has emerged, you open up this hive down here little entrance where the bees come and go right and the queen comes and goes okay and she goes out on mating flights for the first week or so of her life now the weather has to be reasonably good for her to go out it's usually around the middle of the day she'll go um, but she would fly maybe up to 10 miles uh, to what's known as a drone congregation area where 
all the all the lads get together <laughs> and they hang out waiting for a queen to show up. <laughs> Just like the they hang out, yeah, they hang out like the lads in the pub, you know, or whatever, yeah. you know, or at the rugby club or wherever it happens to be. So she arrives on the scene and uh, if you actually see pictures of drones and put that beside a worker bee or beside a queen, they're quite different. They're big chunky lads, like the rugby players, but they have enormous eyes. And the purpose of their enormous eyes is that they're able to find the queen. Uh, they have so many more um, lenses in their eyes. So they have more so vision. They, so they have much, much better vision. And they literally, um, they're on the watch out for a queen once they're in the drone congregation area. Now tell me about this maiden voyage thing. Yeah, well the maiden voyage, actually it's it's a mating voyage, mating flight, and she will go out on a, a number of occasions, and she should mate. Ideally a beekeeper wants a queen to be mated maybe 12, 15 times, and that means that she's got a nice bit of genetic diversity in her eggs later on, you know, that she's able to produce good, healthy brood uh, and workers later you know um, and uh, once then once she's actually out there on her maiden voyage um, she finds through pheromones she finds where the drones are hanging out uh, and then they through pheromones also and just the very good eyesight what I find end. interesting is about the bee is that uh, its relationship with humans is so universal yeah. it's every culture yeah. and I think like the cat the serpent and the bee yeah. seems to be a common allegory or, or you know symbolism all over human history. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, if you if you go uh, apparently in one of the um, one of the um, pyramids in Egypt, uh, they found a jar of honey sealed with wax, uh, and the honey was absolutely perfect in it. After three and, after and a half thousand years. Yeah. yeah something in that sort of leaf, yeah. And you'll find in the hieroglyphics around Egypt and in ancient uh, Greece, uh, Crete it's quite famous, there's a very famous brooch, gold brooch of a bee um, that, that is uh, dates right back to the known times. about the scarcity of bees? Well at the moment we have a bit of for bees um, that started last August. And we're not going to be able to satisfy the demand this year, so we will we'll have to disappoint some of the people that were later putting their names down for bees. Uh, why do, you have, do you have any theories on why the bees are becoming so rare? Well, it's just because it's been a very severe year, so it's been really Weather -wise. difficult. Yeah, it's, it's been really difficult for people who breed bees in those conditions to get them to the stage where they're able to reproduce. Now, they will reproduce some, but it's just the numbers will be less. Well, what do you think about things like uh, people speculate that Wi-Fi, uh, radio transmissions, yeah. high frequency transmissions, and even pesticides may be a factor? Well, I, I can definitely say pesticides are a factor. There's a, new, a group of uh, pesticides called neonicotinoids. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they're definitely a problem. Um, uh, pesticide, that's a problem because the bee doesn't stay on one field. Yes. The bee will go around different farms and, yeah. uh, you know, and work on different plants. So if there's a cocktail of pesticides being used in an area, especially where there's intensive agriculture, it's, it's a big problem. Luckily, in Leitrim, we don't have intensive ar agriculture. Because the land is not that Land's good. not good. Yeah. It's not, you know, I mean, it's mainly grass that's the yeah. farm uh, crop and beef, Crazy. <laughs> you know, and sheep. The, the Monsanto company, this psychopathic, I, I, which I believe, monstrosity, mm. which uh, creates these things called terminator seeds. Mm. They're actually genetically modified crops, mm. which have inside them a seed which terminates the actual next generation. Yeah. Do you think, I, I often spec, well, not I haven't speculated, but I do wonder if there's been a crossover mm. in genetic uh, transfer from these terminator speeds, seeds into, you know, maybe, you know, insects are very sensitive. They have a very, yeah. se particularly bees, have a very high metabolism they and they have a very sensitive, uh, you know, physiology. Yeah. They're, they're uh, you know, this is, I know it's yeah. a big subject. I'm not going to push it, push it on it. I wouldn't know. Uh, yeah, I, that's, how I, that's how I feel too. But I feel that 
what Monsanto yeah. is an affront to humanity and to Well, thank you for saying that. World, thank you for saying you know, that. Yeah. The insect world especially. Yeah. No, thank you for saying that because yeah. that's how I feel about it as well. It's yeah. like the thing with Monsanto yeah. is it's like no no corporation has the uh, has the exclusive monopoly on 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 genetic reality. But they're claiming ownership of things that are not theirs. Yes, fish they, and well, yeah. the Ma seeds the seeds that they are selling are seeds that came from somewhere else. Yeah. Those seeds didn't those original seeds yeah. didn't belong to them. Yeah. So I just think their legal argument is very dodgy.